Now that you're here at Grief to Growth, I'd like to ask you to do three things. The first thing is to make sure that you like, click notifications, and subscribe to make sure you get updates from my YouTube channel. Also, if you'd like to support me financially, you can support me through my tip jar at grief2growth.com. It's grief the number two growth.com slash tip jar, or look for tip jar at the very top of the page or buy me a coffee at the very bottom of the page and you can make a small financial contribution. The third thing I'd like to ask is to make sure you share this with a friend through all your social media, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. Thanks for being here. Close your eyes and imagine. What if the things in life that cause us the greatest pain, the things that bring us grief, are challenges? Challenges designed to help us grow, to ultimately become what we were always meant to be. We feel like we've been buried, but what if, like a seed, we've been planted? And having been planted, we grow to become a mighty tree. Now, open your eyes. Open your eyes to this way of viewing life. Come with me as we explore your true, infinite, eternal nature. This is Grief to Growth, and I am your host, Brian Smith. Hey everyone, it's Brian back with another episode of Grief to Growth. And today I've got with me Christine Dominiak. And Christine and I have known each other kind of, I've been in her Facebook group for several years, but this is the first time we've actually met and had a conversation. So I'm really looking forward to talking to her today about uh, after death communications. She's a certified grief recovery specialist. She's the founder of the ADC, which is After Death Communications Prayer Wave, which is, and she's internationally recognized as an expert on afterlife signs. She's the author of the book, After Death Communications, God's Gift of Love, and four other books for adults and children on afterlife contacts. She conducts seminars and workshops on signs from heaven at national and local conferences. And so with that, I want to welcome to Grief to Growth, Christine Dominiak. Thank you, Brian. It's an honor to be here with you. It's, it's an honor to have you here. And as I, as I said, um, you and I, I have known each other, and I guess in a way for several years, I've been part of your group on Facebook. I found it not too long after my daughter, Shana, passed away. Uh, mm -hmm. And it really, your work has really helped me edu educate me on this thing called after death communications. So mm -hmm. uh, to get started, I guess we should probably define for people, what does after death communications mean? It means getting an after afterlife sign in some form from your loved one who has transitioned over to heaven. Now, some people will call it a spontaneous sign, but I don't think that's necessarily so um, because you can pray for a sign and that would not be as spontaneous as if you never prayed for one. So any kind of a sign like a dream visit, hearing someone call your, your name, um, a, a dime, a penny, some kind of coin uh, that keeps being left over and over again. Uh, you may get a text message on your phone from their cell phone, which has been disconnected. You may get a picture on your computer from them and you had nothing to do with that. You may turn on the radio and a song that connects you to them will just happen to come on. So that those are the types of things that I'm talking about. Of course, there's what I call apparitions, which is what happened to me back in 1998, which started me on this journey to find out all about after death communications. In 1998, my dead in-laws showed up in my bedroom and they stayed for an hour. And I had never had a spiritual experience before. So this was really mind blowing to me. <laughs> what? And I woke up my husband to tell him his parents were in the room but he did not have the ability that night to see them. Only I was able to see them. And they stayed for an hour until I couldn't keep my eyes open any longer. And I waved goodbye and they waved goodbye back. And I thought, well, this is really intriguing. And I thought it was just a one off. But every night for a few weeks, they kept coming back over and over again, which forced me to find out why the heck were they coming? What, what was going on here? And that's when I really got into the field of after death communications, because what I found was people who were getting a sign from their loved ones and recognized it as such seemed to be so much more at peace with the passing. But yet there were so many people out there that were just 
dying to get a sign because they felt like they, they had to know that the loved one was okay. And they would say, unless I get a sign, I'll never know that they're at peace and with God. So that's when I formed after death communication and prayer wave, because I believed in the power of prayer. And every Friday we pray for people who want to get a sign. And out of those prayers, people who were longing to get signs started to get signs and we were getting an abundance of signs. It was really amazing how the prayers were working. And I think because too, they're unselfish prayers, you're praying for somebody else. So, so many people have been healed because of that, because they realize that their loved ones can still see and hear them. They're not off on a black hole somewhere. They're still a huge part of their lives. So anything that you did not get a chance to say before they passed over, you could still say to them, whether it's verbally or in a letter, all those unexpressed emotions that you wish you had a chance to say was still available for you to say because they still see us and they still hear us. So it's never too late to say goodbye to the physical you, but hello to the new spiritual relationship that we're now going to have, or I love you, I forgive you, forgive me, thank you for all those unexpressed emotions that keep people from healing too. Uh, a lot of people keep reliving things over and over in their minds, things that they may have done or said because they didn't have an opportunity to express regret for that. And by knowing that they can still see and hear you, that's open to you, that's available to you and it helps in your healing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do want to ask you, I'm, I'm really curious, you said your in-laws appeared to you the first time they stayed an hour. What were they mm -hmm. doing? <laughs> well, I'll tell you the whole thing that happened. Um, I woke up from a dream around four in the morning mm -hmm. and I saw in the corner of my room uh, in this, near the ceiling was a man and he looked like an Italian padre. He had that type of hat on, it was black, he had on a red cloak. And he was sitting at a desk with his hands in a prayerful manner. He's reading a book and um, he was suspended in space. And I kept blinking my eyes thinking, what is this? And when's it going to go away? <laughs> so finally, after about 15 long seconds, he did dissipate. And all of a sudden there were spirits at the foot of my bed, but these were not the peaceful kind that this gentleman was. These were really scary looking. They had skeleton faces. Some of them were choking each other. I said, oh my goodness, this can't be good. What the heck is this? And I had rosary beads under my bed, so uh, under my pillow. So I started praying the rosary. And next thing I know, the whole room turned blue with like white sparkling lights going through it. Papers on my bureau were, were being rustled. And I saw this woman over my doorway after that, well, dressed in white, just her head in a veil, as if to say, it, everything is okay now. You can be at peace and you can relax. It's safe. And as soon as that happened, I felt this tremendous peace. And I started to get into the whole situation. So I'm thinking, well, there were still some spirits at the foot of the bed. They kind of look like radio waves in a way. And um, I thought, well, who would want to visit me? I wasn't grieving anybody. And then it came into my mind that my husband, father, and, and mother had passed. And when his father had passed, he was so close to his father that he cried every night for a year. Mm -hmm. So that person came into my mind and I, and I said, John, is that you? And um, next thing I know, one of the spirits came like right up from the foot of my bed, five inches in front of my face. He had on a fedora hat, a suit jacket a little hanky in his pocket, a straight tie. And I said, oh my gosh, John, you're here. I can't believe it. And then I remembered his wife, Stella. They would always travel together. They were very close. And I said, well, is Stella here too? Next thing you know, a woman comes right up to my face and she's floating in front of John and she has on a flapper's hat, red lipstick and pearls. And I said, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're here. I mean, I'm really going with it now, Brian. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so then I remember, oh, my husband's sound asleep and his parents are in the room and like, he can't miss this. So I woke him up and I said, Bob, Bob, your parents are here. Wake up, wake up. And I pointed to where they were, but he did not have the ability to see them that night. Just mm -hmm. I had the ability to see them. 
and neither of us could hear anything. But I knew my husband believed me because I could see his lips like silently talking to them. And it made me feel good. At least he believed me. He didn't think I was some nut job. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So after about an hour, I got really tired. I said, thank you so much for coming. And what an honor. And I waved goodbye and they waved back at me. And um, the next day, I told my parents all about it. And they had never had a spiritual experience. And they were so excited about it, too. Mm -hmm. And my parents were... And they're kind of interesting to hear my story, but they kept coming back night after night. And um, until which really forced me into this field to find out what it was all about. And I don't know if you knew of uh, the book Hello from Heaven by the Guggenheims. Yes. Guggenheim and Bill okay. So I contacted Judith Guggenheim and I said, Do you have an idea what this is all about? I mean, they keep coming around. I don't know what this is about. And she recommended a medium to me named Sonny Wells. And so I always felt uncomfortable about mediums because I'm a Catholic and, you know, we're warned against going to mediums, but I felt like I had to go to a medium. I don't care what they say. And she was a Christian medium. So I felt that we had similar beliefs and I felt very safe with her. And we contacted my guardian angel and I asked him, what is this all about? Why are they coming you know, was this a health warning? And he said, no, they were just uh, stopping by to say hello. And um, they explained I had a mission and that um, he explained what the mission was, that I was going to be helping people spiritually, emotionally, and eventually with touch healing. And and uh, God wants to know if you accept this mission. I said, what? <laughs> say what? <laughs> God? <laughs> well, who, what fool is going to say no to God when your angels present it that way? Mm -hmm. I was like okay sign me up guys and um and then I felt like everything that I was doing had a purpose and I had a divine purpose and that you know as long as I honored God and put God in my work because he wanted me to do this you know I would be a I my my guidance would be good guidance and it would be very helpful to people because God wanted this and not me it wasn't like a um, prideful thing or you know, it was coming that God wanted this to help people who were grieving. Mm-hmm. So that's how it all started for me, Brian. Wow. <laughs> wow. That is quite, a, that's quite a start. You're in a mission from God, literally. I know. You know, I read the Bible. I mean, I didn't want to get, you know, have like lightning strike me. So I said, sure, sign me up. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting that you say that because um, a lot of times people that are Christians that are Catholics are taught that this is, this is wrong, that we can't do this, that the dead are dead, they're asleep, they're in heaven, they're whatever, they're not here with us. So how did you overcome that? Well, it was interesting, because I had prayed really hard for guidance, and I was sent to Sunny Wells, the Christian medium. But Catholics have an advantage over others, uh, of some other uh, belief systems, because we have all these books of these recognized saints that make apparitions. So it's it's in our, our wheelhouse to have uh, saying to make apparitions. What I didn't know was that normal, ordinary people who are now spirits could do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So that was brand new to me. I said, well, they're not sleeping. They're, you know, they're making visits. So, um, yeah. And I felt like you could either listen to preachers and, um, go with their philosophy, or you could pray to God's Holy Spirit and go where he's leading you. And I, I'd rather go where God's leading me than where man was leading me. And that was my philosophy. That was my, how I felt about it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I love that because, you know, I do get a lot of people pushing back on, on the work that I do, talking to people who had NDEs, talking to mediums, et cetera, and say, this is not, this is not biblical. Um, but I've also, and I love, you know, when, when you say the word, even Christian medium, I know some people consider it to be an oxymoron. You can't be a Christian and a medium, but I know people who are. They're very prayerful, who have, who studied the Bible, who who ask God for what they want for what He wants for their life, and they they believe this is what God wants for them. I believe it's a gift from the Holy Spirit, and it's talked about in the Bible anyway in the New Testament. And in fact, because children naturally have a gift to see and hear spirits, where we adults wish that we could, they naturally have it, and. 
sometimes, many times I'd get to stay with them. And so I wrote a book for children called Heaven Talks to Children, Mm -hmm. um, which gives guidance to parents. and how to do it safely, how to protect them from spirits that are not from God. Because there are those, as those skeleton faces that were choking each other showed me that night, that not everything is good that comes to visit us. And sometimes they will exploit the um, the grief and the pain that uh, um, someone who is bereaved is going through. And you have to learn how to differentiate the good guys from the bad guys, the, your real loved one who's there to bring you comfort and some other imposter spirit who, which happens lots of times in dreams, for instance, um, sometimes people get dreams of their loved one where they look like they're in pain or they're bleeding or they're, or they're um, ignoring them or they're angry at them. When God sends our loved ones to us, it's to bring us comfort. It's not to upset us. And if that is happening, which I run, run across a lot of people who have that and they don't understand it and it makes them feel worse, of course. Mm-hmm. I say, say a prayer protection every night before you go to bed and you will find that this will start leaving and the good dreams that you want from your real loved one will start coming through and you'll see that that will, that will end. And that usually works if you do it faithfully. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point and maybe a very important point that um, because I think people, this fear is about these bad spirits. And I've talked to lots of Christians that said, don't do this, don't do that, because evil spirits can come. Um, but you, you, as you said, you have to be able to discern. That's right. And you and you ask for God's protection and um, and he wants to give it to you. But that's free will. That's your choice. So, um, yeah. And I have prayers of protection in there. And it's for any medium, really, who um, who is dealing with the spirit world. Uh, some some mediums don't believe that there are there's any evil out there, and they can be taken advantage of. So I hope my book, you know, will leave a mark and give them something to think about, even if they reject that concept. Because I want to see everyone protected, and I want their experiences to be the best that they can possibly be. So yeah, in yeah, fact, I- even in the Bible. Uh, uh, John uh, tells us how to discern spirits to be sure they're from God. So obviously the apostles were talking to spirits because how would he know, right? right. How, how to do it. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. If you're given instructions on how to talk to spirits, I think it assumes that you are talking to spirits and we all talk <laughs> right, about exactly. the, ho- the Holy spirit and the fact that yes. we're all spirit beings. Um, mm-hmm. And, but we're, but we're told as soon as our loved ones cross over, we can't talk to them anymore. That's that's a bad thing. That's an evil thing. Yeah, I think it's fear um, because I, my husband's brother was a priest for 50 years until he passed about 10 years ago. And when I first told him that his parents were visiting me in my bedroom, he, you know, I could see like the alarm button going off because he was a Catholic priest and you're not supposed to be dealing with this. And um, when my first book came out, um, I was free to tell him because I thought, well, what's he going to think of me? You know, because these are all these stories of people's experiences with their loved ones, their 20 common afterlife signs and all their experiences. And um, but I was really surprised because uh, at this point, years had gone by and he was in a retirement home for priests and he starts selling my book <laughs> to the other priests. So, wow, he's come a long way baby, wow. to do that, wow. because when I used to tell him about it in the beginning, we go out to lunch together when he was down visiting and he would always like warn me and I'd leave crying. And I said, you know, we just have to agree to disagree on this because this is my calling and, um, and I know how to do it um, carefully to protect myself. So it's okay. And so we, we stopped talking about it, but when my book came out, he was selling it to all his priest buddies. So that, that was a good thing. That's absolutely true. And you know, the thing is, as you were saying, as I'm thinking about, you know, Jesus said that we'll know a tree by its fruits. Um, and so it, I, I see what mediumship and what afterlife communications, as you mentioned, when we were first started, how it's healed people, how it's really absolutely. taken people that are deep in grief and, and just transformed that. Absolutely. Yeah. But- Sonny, he assigned her to be my mentor. And that was really wonderful because we would sit and have chats with the angels, 
regularly asking, well, how do things work in heaven? And, you know, we, all kinds of questions that we had, and we even had a radio show for a while called Ask the Angels on Blog Talk Radio, where people could ask the angels questions. Mm -hmm. But uh, not only that, um, I got to talk to my parents. Uh, I got to talk to my priest brother-in-law, who apologized, by the way, (laughs) for not believing me and not investigating what I was telling him. So when when Sonny and I, when Sonny contacted him, that guy talked for an hour and a half straight. We could not get a word in edgewise. He was so excited to be able to talk to us. So it was really, really, really nice. And um, I got to talk to my in-laws. And so it is really a very healing thing uh, that you've I felt like it was just a phone call. I was talking on the phone to my parents or whomever. And that is so healing. I agree with you, Brian. There's just nothing like it. Well, it's, you know, it's one thing for us to, to have faith and, and faith is great. And it's one thing to believe what the religious people tell us and believe what the Bible tells us, but there's nothing like experience. And I think people, they don't dare to even dream that they can have an experience, that they can actually talk to that person again. Um, and have this communication. So I do want to point out, though, for people that are that are new to this, that apparitions are very rare. Um, most of us do not see apparitions, but there are lots of very common signs. Right, right. And um, apparitions are rare. I did not realize that at the time. But um, but sometimes people will see visions of their loved ones, like in their their mind's eye, where you know maybe your eyes are open or closed, and you see something that would be like a vision of them. And uh, similar to how you would in a dream. So yes, apparitions, I believe, take a lot of energy from the spirit to be able to do that. And and you know what? It can be a little um, disconcerting to have a spirit show up in your bedroom. Mm -hmm. So you probably would prefer a dream visit. (laughs) Most normal people would, I think. Yeah, because you still get to see them. I, you know, it's interesting. I think a lot of times we wish for things that we don't really, we don't really want if we really knew in our heart. I've heard a lot of people say, I wish I would have an NDE. And it's like, no, you really don't want an NDE. And think about how would you really respond if you saw your loved one show up in your bedroom for, I yeah. think you said for most of us, it would freak us out no matter how much we're missing them. Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. So I think the dream visits are probably the best because sometimes you get to hug them. Sometimes you get taken to in heaven to see where they're living. Uh, it just all depends on what God has in store for you, what he allows you, your experiences to be. So I love the dream visits. They're wonderful. Yeah. And the thing about dream visits, let's talk about the difference between having a dream about your loved one and having a dream visit. Oh, um, well, I kind of think it's one and the same to tell you the truth. Um, if they're in the dream, that's a dream visit, I, I believe. So yeah, and uh, and it, it may be that you may even have a dream where you're in a house, maybe where you used to live, and you're not you're not seeing them, but you feel their presence in that, mm. you know, in the background. Um, I remember uh, one time my parents visited me in a dream, mm-hmm. and it was a dream visit. I think they're one and the same, and um, if it's bringing you comfort, so. Yeah. I was in the, uh, I was somewhere probably in heaven because everything felt very, very holy and sacred. And um, my dad was in the driveway and he led me up these stairs and I came into this like apartment type building and there was a kitchen on the left and there was what you would call a parlor on the right and there was a hallway. And I knew my mother was in that parlor and everything felt so, so sacred that I felt like when I go in that parlor, I bet my mom's going to be reading a Bible because this place is really something else. But when I went into the room and saw my mother, she was just flipping through a magazine <laughs> and not a Bible. And uh, and I was so this is the first time I had seen her after she passed. And so I was so happy to see her. I start crying. Oh, oh, mom, I'm so happy to see you. And I miss you so much. And she was like shocked that I, she thought I was going to be very happy. And I was, but she didn't realize I was going to break down in tears. So we were both surprised. So she waited a while before she came to visit me in the dream again, because I think she didn't want me to feel sad at all. She was looking for a happier time. So she did come one other time. Um, I had this dream where I was in a, a bedroom and I was lying in bed. There were a lot of people in the room and my mother and I think maybe her sister were by the doorway. And I looked around the room and I said, this isn't a dream, is it? And she looked around the room to, to look for permission to whether she could 
tell me you're not. And she said, uh, no, it's not a dream. And I said, oh, okay. And I think they said, you have to go now. So when I left, I actually felt my stomach drop. Like I was going down an elevator very quickly, mm-hmm. like tower of terror kind of a feeling mm-hmm. in Disney world. And um, so I realized I was out of my body and that, you know, when they sent me back, I was like put back in my body very quickly with my spirit. So that was the only time I really felt that sensation. Yeah. But that was fun. Yeah. Yeah. The, well, what I meant earlier about the dream versus the dream visit, visit and you and you actually said it, if something doesn't bring you comfort, if you see your loved ones suffering or if they're telling you to harm yourself or something like that, right. that right. is that is not of God, that is not a dream visit. That was my point. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I like to tell people that a lot because they, if you're not aware, you get taken advantage of and these things can really harm you and uh, get you to be very depressed and sad. So Yes. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of people long for dream visits. That seems to be one of the preferred signs. But what I, uh, I know you have a list of 20 signs that are available in your book, and we don't have time to go through all this today, but give people some ideas of some things that they may not know that are signs. We all know about coins and feathers. Uh, but what are some other things that people can look for? Um, well, touches, for instance. Um When my dad comes, he will massage the top of my head. And he usually does that when I'm in the middle of a seminar. (laughs) And I'm talking about after my signs and I feel him rubbing the top of my head and it cracks me up. And when my mother comes, she will tickle the left side of my face. So um, now yesterday I was on my way to uh, an hour's drive to a studio for an interview. And on the way down, I heard my mother's song on the radio. It came on twice twice, not just mm-hmm. once, but twice. Like, oh, mom, hi. And then when I was in the middle of talking, I felt like this tickle on my left lip. And I thought, and I was trying not to laugh because I didn't want to like um, ruin the flow of the interview, but uh, it was really cute. So things like that. Sometimes you'll feel them um, hold your hand or uh, pat you on the shoulder or stroke your hair. Um, it's, see what else here oh pictures uh picture may fall off the wall of them or the picture of them that might be on your desk is the only one that falls over or you might find a letter left from them out in the middle of your living room and there's no way that could have gotten there on its own so these are the other types of signs and you know if you have this feeling that this is peculiar peculiar is what we're looking for and that that signals that you know they're trying to get you to notice because when they give you an afterlife sign, they also simultaneously will put the thought in your head that this is from them. And that's another reason why you notice. So um, animals that act like they know you or birds or insects that act like they know you. Uh, that's another way that they uh, let us know that they're around us. Mm-hmm. And you just mentioned something that I think a lot of people aren't aware of and it might freak some people out that they can put thoughts in our head. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, they, they are not allowed to interfere with our free will, but they can help us with guidance. So, and sometimes when they're actually talking to us, um, you will hear a thought. It'll be strong. And many times it's repeated, like maybe three times in a row. And you know, it's not coming from you because you weren't thinking about that. For instance, my younger sister, when my, uh, when my dad passed, she did not believe in afterlife signs. And my mother and I used to talk about, oh, daddy visit us this way, he visit us that way. And we would be so excited. And my sister would walk out of the room because she didn't believe in it and it bothered her. But finally it started to get to her and it was the first Easter after my dad passed. And my sister went to the cemetery and she said, daddy, daddy, just speak to me, speak to me, speak to me. And she heard, take care of mommy, take care of mommy, take care of mommy. She heard that thought three times in her head and she knew he was speaking to her. Mm-hmm. That's what she asked her and that's what she got. So many times it, it can sound like your own voice talking to you, but you know, it's not, it's separate. It's like a separate compartment in your brain that's uh, talking to you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, I think, difficult if people, especially if they don't know that it's possible 
And, and, and it's not, you know, the idea of them putting thoughts in your head, it's not mind control. It's more like speaking to you. It's more like yeah. if I said to you, Christine, you should do this. You, you heard me audibly, but it's an internal thing. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's not, it's not mind control. That's a good, good term for a bride. I love that. Yeah, it's like suggestions and helpful little hints to help uh, guide us. And it's up to us. We have free will whether we want to listen to the, the guidance that we're getting or not. We'll get back to grief to growth in just a few seconds. Did you know that Brian is an author and a life coach? If you're grieving or know someone who is grieving, his book, Grief to Growth, is a best-selling, easy-to-read book that might help you or someone you know. People work with Brian as a life coach to break through barriers and live their best lives. You can find out more about Brian and what he offers at www.grieftogrowth.com www.grief, the number two, G-R-O-W-T-H dot com, or text GROWTH, G-R-O-W-T-H, to 31996. If you'd like to support this podcast, visit www.patreon.com slash grief to growth, www.patreon dot com slash G-R-I-E-F, the number two, G-R-O-W-T-H, to make a financial contribution. And now back to grief to growth. So and one thing when you were telling your your story of how you started with this, I thought was really interesting is that your husband's parents who he was missing first came to you and you and you mentioned he wasn't able to see them the night. So I have two questions. One is was he able to see them later? But the first question is why do you think they came to you as opposed to coming to him? Well, when spirits visit, they may not visit the person who's principally affected because maybe you're really grieving. So they'll go to someone who is much easier to receive spirit communication. And the idea is not to bypass you or to make you jealous, but to uh, get a message to you that they're around, that they're at peace, that they're okay. So now in my case, it was a lifestyle change because my I used to be in the business world and I was a stay-at-home mom for my two children and they were becoming teenagers and I was contemplating going back into the business world. So this was like an, a, a change in direction uh, for me. They want, God wanted me to be in a different, wanted to be in the grief support world. And so if they hadn't come in such a big way, I never would have chosen this path. I mean, mm -hmm. it just wouldn't have, you know, ever dawned on me. So he had a really give me that burning bush kind of a thing to get me going because it was just so amazing that it, uh, I had to follow it. I had to follow it. Yeah. yeah. So there was, there was a mission, there was a message for you as well as the, the message for your husband. And I, again, was he able to see them at, at other times? Never, no, never. Okay. And uh, which was really kind. And he doesn't even remember his dreams. So I know they, they visit him in his dreams, but he just doesn't remember. So, but he's okay with that. I mean, mm -hmm. He, uh, he, he's a right. And he, in the beginning, he had a hard time with what was happening to me, but eventually he became like my biggest fan, you know, and uh, would, would come to my seminars if it were local. And uh, yeah. And in the beginning, I felt like he kind of was, um, wasn't sure, but now like, I, no matter what I tell him, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So he's, he's really, he's believes and, and he loves when he sees, how it helps other people. That's a very gratifying to him. Yeah. And when people share, even friends, their experiences, he loves to just listen to that because he knows we're on the same wavelength and he's accepted it. So it's good. Yeah. That's fantastic that he supports you that way. You know, I, the thing is, um, is with people, sometimes people I hear will get upset because uh, their loved one will come to maybe not even an immediate family, but maybe a cousin or a neighbor. And the neighbor will de deliver the message, but there, there's a reason for that. And it's not because your loved one doesn't love you or doesn't want to come to you. Exactly. exactly. It's just way easier to get to the other person because they may have a little gift and, uh, or, and when you're so into grief, um, like I know a lot of um, parents, especially moms will say to me, I was so into my grief. I didn't see all the signs I was getting outside of myself. And it took me a number of months to start to recognize the signs I was getting. So it's almost like you put up a steel door sometimes and they, they're knocking to get through, but they can't because there's just this wall or door. So they'll go to someone, 
to get that message to do it. Oh, I saw them. They're fine. They're, you know, they visit me in a dream. They're at peace. They look great. And, and I, I would like to reiterate, it's not that they don't want to visit you and you should never feel jealous. They just took the opportunity to get to someone who could get you that message who could easier receive from them. So that's why they do it that way. Yeah. And there, and there's a, um, some of us, as you said, your husband doesn't remember dreams. Some of us don't remember our dreams. That that can be a, a thing. They might have come to visit us and we don't remember because uh, mm-hmm. dreams, dreams fade really fast when we wake up. It's just the nature. So of- I have a few tips about that, Brian, that might yeah, be helpful. That'd be great. Yes. Um, yeah. So if you are desirous of a dream visit, I always say, ask God every night before you go to bed to allow your loved one to visit you in a comforting way in a dream. And then, um, Imagine yourself before you go off to sleep, being with them in a maybe your favorite spot together, for instance, and keep a pad and pen right under your pillow. Because many times when you get that dream visit, you know it, and then you're starting to wake up and it's starting to fade. But if you start scribbling down on that pad before you're fully awake, you'll get bits and pieces of the dream and realize, oh, yes, they visited me, even though I can't remember right now. Now, of course, the dreams that are really, really vivid are very easy to remember. Mm-hmm. They will stick with you. But not all dreams are that vivid. And uh, unless you wake up right away, you may not remember it. So that's why it's good to just jot it down whatever you can, um, you know, their name or whatever, where you are, you know, in a room, whatever. And then you realize, oh, yes, they did visit me. They did visit me. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. And, and dreams are, um, again, I, I think, they're maybe they're the biggest thing. We love the dreams, but uh, when people are saying when they can't get to us through dreams, sometimes you know they can maybe get through us through coins and feathers and all the other things that we think about songs. But mm-hmm. if you're not open to that, if your eyes aren't open to that, then you're you're going to miss them, and your loved one's going. What do you, I just did that? Well, you can simplify it for yourself too. <laughs> for instance. Um, I always say, if you want a sign from your loved one and you may be getting lots of signs, but they're very subtle. Most of them are very subtle. So it's easy to overlook them. So I say, go to God, ask to God to allow your loved one to leave you a sign and then state something specific to your loved one that you would recognize as a sign from them. Say, you know, a butterfly or a type of bird or whatever it is that comes across to you. So then when that does happen, when you get that particular bird visiting you, you'll know, oh, yes, I, there's my sign because you requested that specific sign. So that's another way to be able to get the one to know that they're, they're visiting you because you requested it and they delivered. Yes. And, and some people don't realize that some people don't realize that spirits can't do anything that they want to do. They need permission. There's a hierarchy up there and God's at the top. So, you know, sometimes God might feel, well, this is not the right time or, you know, I have a different plan or so he's always looking out for our welfare. So if you go to him and, you know, I, I also don't believe that you should just pray to your angels because the angels can only they're, they're messengers of God, they're helpers, but they only can do what God assigns them to do. So if you're bypassing God, you're bypassing the big, biggest source of help and love you could possibly have in your life. So always go to the top guy and ask him, you know? That's an interesting point. I, you know, one thing I say to people, I, I say, you we can't always get what we want, but I think we get what we need. And, and right. as, as limited beings living from a limited perspective, We may think that this is the best thing for us, whatever this thing happens to be. I want a dream visit or I want an NDE or I want an apparition, but that may not be the best thing for us at this point in time. Um, So there's 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 an element of trust that what we're getting is what we're supposed to get. Right, exactly. And um, I, I have found in my work that the people who really do believe that God loves them and has a relationship with God are the ones that heal the best, heal faster. They don't seem to be, ah, they just seem to be be more at peace with things that are happening and, uh, or what what has happened to them. And, um, you know, a lot of people don't believe in God. And and I always say, well, okay, you don't believe in God, uh, but what can it hurt to say a prayer? 
it can't hurt, right? It could be really something wonderful could happen. So, you know, throw it out there and see what happens. God is, might be waiting for them so he can answer their prayer in some way so they can establish that relationship and know that he exists and that they're loved, you know, that they're loved. So, uh, I, I love the fact that you use the language that you, that you do, that you talk about God and you talk about Holy Spirit and, 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 the, and those things, because I think it gives permission to people who have that background to say this is okay. But that term's very loaded for a lot of people as well, a lot of people who've been burned by religion. Um, and I've talked to a lot of people who are, are call themselves atheists and say they don't believe in God. And I'll ask them, what, what God don't they believe in? And it's always a God I don't believe in either. Uh, that this, you know, this judgmental God, this uh, God who, who, yeah. who condemns us, this God who's always looking out to see we're doing bad. And, you know, we, some of us have a lot of baggage with that term. So I think mm -hmm. for, for some people, maybe, I understand. Mm -hmm. yeah. I understand that because, well, you can substitute it with like divine source or creator or whatever makes you feel comfortable. But I remember, I mean, I went to a Catholic school and we had very strict nuns teaching us. And they never told us that God loves us. They were always like, God is angry and he's going to be mad. And, and it was, I feared God. Mm -hmm. And, and then one day when I was maybe around 20, I, I really didn't want to think of God that way. And I remember that Jesus was always so kind and loving. And, and I found this picture of Jesus with children all around him and I bought that picture and I have it hanging on my wall to this day. And that picture uh, transformed me into thinking of God as loving and not an angry God. All right. Okay. So the old Testament, he is angry a lot. No doubt about it. But the new Testament, Jesus is full of love. He is love. And I like to follow that Jesus, you know, that God. So that picture always reminds me of how sweet and kind he is. And I also think of God as, like giving us TLC. And um, I pray like about the, the tiniest little things. If I'm working on a, a, a little carpentry uh, project, you know, but oh, please, please let me get this going, please, please. Get. And then it'll work, you know? And I, I pray about the tiniest little things. And maybe people think that you should only talk about big things, but he's this way God's incorporated in so many things of my life. I'm praying to him for help all the time, you mm -hmm. know? And I, that's why I'm always a hopeful person because I felt like he, he's going to take care of me. And in fact, my mother, uh, all through our lives, she would say, oh, God, will take care of it. Oh, God, will take care of me. Oh, God. And like, I grew up with that mantra from my mother and that must have been internalized in me because later on when, when things were rough in my life, that really helped see me through a lot of like adversities. And um, yeah, yeah. So I think the more little things you pray about, you'll start to see, oh, he's helping in this little little way and maybe you're helping in a big way. And it just becomes a process of, of uh, just part of the daily relationship that you have with God. It's just so second nature. I think so. You know, it's interesting we talked about Jesus because for me as a kid growing up, I was hearing about this guy and I was like, <clears throat> I love Jesus, but I don't know about this God guy. Um, I know. So I I've, al you down. <laughs> I've always been, I've always been an admirer of Jesus. And I'm still an admirer of Jesus, but yeah. you know, God needed like a, a, a makeover. He needed a, 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 a reputation, you know, rehabilitation. And I, I think that's why we have Jesus because yeah. nobody can relate to that God that before, you know, yeah. that God. And, and that's not who God is. I want to make that clear to people. That's, that's man's view of God. That, right. that that we we impose on him but we were told as kids well god does love you but he has to be he has to be, have justice too so therefore there is this eternal place that he'll send you to you know and, and those types of things but but god's a forgiving god right. so you know just ask for forgiveness <clears throat> you won't have to be afraid of the next world and you're just like you know we we should forgive other people and we want forgiveness lots of times people are angry at god and they're just so angry at him and I say, well, you know what? God forgives you. Maybe you could just try and forgive God, even if you don't understand why this is happening to you. Just, just give him the benefit of the doubt. Just give him some forgiveness. And uh, I think you'll feel more at peace. Now, this, I think, especially happens, Brian, when a loved one, like your daughter, for instance, passes um, before you think is the right time, like in old age or whatever, and you don't understand 
why would God be so mean? Why, why would he, why would he do that? Why does this person have cancer or whatever they have? And um, if you've been, and I love near death experiences. I love what we learn from them. And my favorite one is Embraced by the Light by Betty Eady. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever read that. That just, when I read that, I said, beam me up, Jesus. This is where I want to be. But what I learned from her, and also with my conversations with Sunny Well and the Angels, is that we, before we come here to earth, God had created us spirits with him. And we have, we volunteer for certain missions and uh, lessons to be learned. And it's always meant to bring us closer to God, have a ripple effect on other people. There's always always supposed to be a great deal of good to come out of what was happening. So for instance, your daughter, you know, uh, she may have like had a, a, an agreement with God that this is the way she was coming in. This is the way she was going to go out because maybe that would be a catalyst for your work. You see, uh, like the, the mothers and mothers um, mad, for instance, their children, part of their agreement with God was to leave that way because they knew that would be a catalyst for their moms to start this movement, which helped to save a lot of people and bring awareness of unnecessary um, deaths and, and maimness from um, accidents due to drunken driving. So like people, young people, Many times they're called, they are what we call angels unawares, and they're actually angels in consciousness that volunteer for these missions, even though they're hard to help the world around them, to help you, for instance, and, and uh, yeah, to bring about a better world. So you probably never would have been in this field if you hadn't lost your daughter at an early age. Oh, I definitely would not be doing this. I would not yeah. be talking to you for, for that's right. that's hundred percent for certain. Right. And, and the, the, the thing is about this trusting God, which has been, a, it's been a factor for me for a long time, because I was a kid, I would look around and say, well, bad things happen, you know, bad things happen to good people. So how can I trust God? Because, you know, bad things happen, but that's, that's that limited perspective that we have that we need to expand beyond to understand that we are spirits. We are pre-existent spirits that that came here for a short time. And then we all go home, you know, it, it's just a matter right. of when and how that's what I would say. It's like, the only difference is, is when and how, what age are we and, and how do we pass? But we all go, and that's not a bad thing. That's part yes. of the plan. Oh yeah. Because that, I mean, just imagine a paradise where you're in no pain, where you can fly by your thoughts, where you feel loved all the time. And, uh, and you, you have a great existence and there's different worlds to explore and uh, creations that you can make. I mean, why would you want to be here? I mean, we're all hold on to, I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave. But yet, as soon as you transition over, you think, oh, what was I fighting? This is a great, great place to be. So, and some of the fun things to do in heaven, which when I got to talk to my parents through Sunny Wells, hmm. um, they, uh, my dad and I used to golf together. So I said, well, are you golfing in heaven? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah. He said, I, he named some names of people he was golfing with. And I said, well, what are the golf courses like? And he said, well, you can create, you create them yourself. You all get together and you say, what do you want, you know, on your golf course? And they create it with their minds mm. that they're going to golf. And my mother said to me, do you believe I'm a golf widow up here? <laughs> <laughs> so, and they used to love to bowl. They were on a mixed uh, team, bowling team. And my mother said, well, yeah, we bowl up here too. She said, now we could really cheat, but then everybody would know. So we don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so there's a lot of fun things to do in heaven. It's just, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, it's interesting that, cause that reminds me of a quote. I'm not going to get it right exactly by C.S. Lewis, but I remember when I was a kid reading this, he talked about how we're children playing with mud pies, you know, at the, at the beach and we, or we could be having a day at the beach or we could be, you know, somewhere else. And we, we we like what we know you know so we we, we say i want to be here i don't want to die that's the worst thing that could ever happen but then on the other hand i'm on facebook all day long with people who are complaining about everything about this world because we complain about it too because right. it is it is a hard place to be but we don't and this is what's so great about your work because we don't really understand or believe what great things wait for us <clears throat> exactly and that's why i love reading near-death experiences because uh, our knowledge through the Bible is very limited about what heaven is like. 
But, and I'm sure that's got, that's why God allowed so many people to have near death experiences and write about them and talk about it. So it just shows you what a wonderful place is waiting for us. And it takes the fear of the unknown out of it for you. So you're not really afraid to die once you start reading these wonderful stories. I mean, you don't want to go through the death process, of course, right. but uh, unless it's quick, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but then if you're not afraid, uh, because you have seen your eyes have been opened about what awaits you and loved ones and your angels and then it just you're okay i had my dad when he was in his 80s read embraced by the light and it took all the fear out of him uh dying yeah wow. he wasn't afraid at all mm -hmm. wow that's, that's awesome i love hearing that and, and the, again even better because i love the nde i i absolutely love it. i love the fact that i know i'm going to see my daughter again that that motivates me to to go forward but also with your work we know that we can talk to them right now that they're still with yes. us they're still part of our life that's that's yes. like the bonus and yes. that's the part that really frankly isn't in the bible it, does, it doesn't really tell us that we can still have that relationship well um Actually, as far as signs, you're correct, but I do remember the time and people who insist that you sleep until, you know, the resurrection, yeah. there was a time when Jesus was here and he was talking about, um, um, uh, about Lazarus talking to Moses and maybe Elijah, I forget. And, um, and how Lazarus uh, wanted to warn his brother, or oh, I know the rich man wanted to warn his brothers. Oh, and, mm -hmm. um, and he said, well, what good does it do them? Because they won't listen. And so Jesus was giving a parable of talking to the dead, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that on the other side, that what's the, you know, that you can talk to the dead, that they're alive and well. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jesus also made, I had a quote that said, God is the God of the living, not the dead. You know so okay. that that there is okay. eternal life so there, there's a lot there are a lot of clues in there but the the end the nde and it's funny because i i had a uh, discussion with a friend of mine who's an evangelical christian and we were talking you know all the stuff i'm into and he's like brian you're, you've gone crazy and mm -hmm. i you know i interview these people who have ndes i said i won't say his name i said you know i interviewed so and so that had an nde the other day and and so they they died they saw light they heard a voice they were transformed and now they're a different person. I said, who does that sound like in the Bible? How about Paul on the road to Damascus? Oh, right. Where exactly. he saw light, he heard a voice, he was <laughs> mm -hmm. struck blind for three days, and then right. he comes back with these amazing abilities and he goes on a mission, he even changes his name, he changes so much. And Paul talked about visiting the seventh heaven. Yes. He'd been taken up to the seventh heaven. Yeah. Yes. Talked about being out of his body and said, I don't right. know, said, I don't know if I was in the body or out of the body and talks about the things that he can't even speak about because they're beyond words, which is, sounds just like people that have had NDE. So there, there are clues in the Bible that tell us that, that this is, is very real. And, and, and we do know that we're spirit beings. So I think it's, it's wonderful that we can have this relationship. And I, um, so I do want to do, uh, before we run out of time, I want to talk about your books because um, you got some fantastic books and want people to know what you have and what they can get from them. So I have, this is my first book, After Death Communications, God's Gift of Love. And this is probably for any adult who is grieving because it has the 20 common signs, tips on receiving a sign, tips for grief healing, survivor's guilt, uh, the purpose of our lives, why do bad things happen to good people. So that is probably the most important book. And then for any medium or child, Heaven talks to children, and it gives a hundred over a hundred sample examples of children's spiritual experiences talking to loved ones. And then, if you're missing a grandpa, if your child grandpa visits from heaven, because they do. Yeah. And then there's Grammy visits from heaven for children, and also in the pages of the book is pictures of heaven and the fun things to do in heaven. So when you are trying to explain to a child what heaven is like. They, they have no idea, but if you can show them pictures and the, the reunion and the, the party that they have when you get there and that you can swim and, and go down sliding boards, things like that. And then this is for military families, daddy visits from heaven for military families. Mm -hmm. It's also mm -hmm. good for first responders. So mm -hmm. um, it helps to explain and what the funeral is like. So um, I think it's just easier for parents if they have illustrations with the story to try and explain where that person is to a child who has no concept of what heaven is and what angels are and what spirit bodies are. 
Those are so needed. And I'm so glad that those are available. I wish they were available when I was a kid. And, you know, your book, uh, Heaven Talks to Children, Afterlife Contacts, I think that's important for parents as well to understand that when your children are saying these things, um, they're still remembering. And a lot of times in our culture, we talk them out of it. And I've noticed, I've, I've studied that other cultures, people tend to hold on to their pre-existence memories longer because mm-hmm. they're not told that it's just a fantasy. Right. Um, and right. so kids remember, and it's funny, I remember our girls when they were like seven and four, because they're three years apart, um, said that we remember being up in heaven and choosing you as our parents. And this is a concept they did not oh. hear from us. I don't, they did not hear from anybody that I, that yeah. I'm aware of. Um, and there's but, some stories in my book, just as you were talking about, just like that, mm-hmm, that they remember being in heaven and who was there with them. And um, yeah, and there's a story about a little girl in the book, she was saying how she was pretty young. She's how she misses Jesus. And she wished she could see Jesus and give him a hug. And, you know, she remembered Jesus, you know, a little kid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, we do have that, that veil of forgetfulness, but there's still, it it kind of leaks through, you know, and I think I, I, I I truly believe that babies still see angels and spirits. They just can't speak yet. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. If they're looking off and they're giggling at something like in the corner of the room, you know, it's like a grandparent probably, or an angel or uh, someone that's coming to play with them. So yeah, yeah, they don't miss anything. Yeah. And that's the same with uh, people who are grieving. Our loved ones come to their weddings and the birth of their babies and their birthdays and their anniversaries. Anything that's important to us is important to them and they will be there and we'll try and show you that they're there. Yeah. yeah. And so my dad, often when we all get together, my family and he'll massage the top of my head and I'll say, daddy's here. And everyone says, hey, daddy. Yeah, that's, <laughs> and, yeah. and that is that is so cool when you can include them as part of the celebrations, you know, yeah. because yeah. we all feel yeah. um, sadness. We all miss them on those days. Um, I remember when my, when my nephew got married a couple of years ago, you know, those things remind us of the people that aren't there with us. But he, they took pictures of Shana and all the, all the people in the wedding party, all the guys had the, a picture of her in, inside of her ties and all the girls oh. had a, a hem of their dresses. Oh. And um, at the reception, they had a picture of Shana on the table. So it was just, you know, we include her as part of the celebration. Yeah. It makes it a lot easier to go through these things. Yeah. And she loves that. She just loves that you remember her and, and being part of it. Yeah. Cause she's enjoying it just like you are. So yeah, that's very neat. I love that. I also want to let people know about your Facebook group, because I think that is such a, a good resource. So tell people about the group. So the, our mission is, is to pray for other people to get an afterlife sign from their loved ones. And then you can post it in my group. You can you know, tell us what you receive. And we do this every Friday. We uh, pray for the whole group. And um, so if you are grieving and, and you want people to pray for you to get a sign, please visit us on Facebook at After Death Communication and Prayer Week. It started out on a message board back in 2000, mm-hmm. and now it's 20, 2022. So we've been around for 22 years praying for people to get that sign. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I know you've helped so many people. I know you you helped me. So I, I appreciate that. Oh, that thank being you. There. I didn't know that. I'm oh. really glad to hear that. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, absolutely. So, Christine, let people know where they can reach you if someone wants to reach out to you. Sure. So on Facebook, Christine Duminiac, or I have a, a website, ChristineDuminiac.com. So you can see my books are there. And if you want to have an appointment with me, uh, I do uh, over the phone appointments. If you're military, they're for free. Um, and um, and where I'm going to be, my different um, venues where I might be speaking. So yeah, just go to my website and I'll, I'll find all that. All right. I want to spell your name for people because I, it'll be in the show notes, but some people listen when they're out and are in their car or something. So it's uh, Christine, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E. And the last name is Dominiac, D-U-M-I-N-I-A-K. Uh, and it's all ChristineDominiac.com is, is where you can find Christine and find her books. Uh, and find all the links and maybe even set up an appointment to speak with her. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's so great meeting you. You're just a lovely person and God bless you for the work that you're doing to help other people. Well, thank you for being here. I can't believe it's been seven years. This is the first time we've actually spoken, but it's good, to, it's, it's good to talk to you. I'm sure we're running into each other again. I hope so. Okay, <laughs> will you take care and thank you again, Brian. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day.
You too. Bye-bye. Don't forget to like, hit that big red subscribe button, and click the notify bell. Thanks for being here.